Welcome back to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So we are continuing, uh, and it deserves this much attention, our di long discussion about the nature of wisdom, uh, because uh, since the actual revolution, it is just crucially connected to uh, uh, the project of, of meaning in life. Uh, last time we finished up a look at Bolton Staudinger and made some criticisms, uh, uh, and that that led into important criticisms made by Monica Ardelt, and then we looked at Ardelt's theory and the way it brought in an important distinction about not just having a good theory of wisdom, but the process of becoming a wise person, and then the emphasis on what are the features of a wise person as, to f as opposed to what are uh, some of the central claims made by a theory of wisdom. And then we talked about how uh, uh, Monica insightfully brings together uh, and the, the, the cognitive, uh, the reflective, and uh, the affective. And I pointed out how within at least the cognitive directly, because of the invocation of Keeks and understanding, we've got uh, relevance realization grasping the significance. I would also point out that I, I think that's at least Im implicit in the reflective uh, machinery, and there's potential, deep potential connection there with both perspectival uh, knowing and uh, the cultivation of rationality, at least perspectival rationality, and the affective uh, ties to agape, which I've already argued has very important uh, connections to relevance realization, and that uh, affords Ardelt's theory uh, a powerful way of connecting wisdom to meaning in life as something uh, different from connecting wisdom to virtue, and that's a very important thing to do. Uh, we still noted some criticisms, uh, uh, that largely it's still a product theory, it doesn't have an independent account of foolishness, and a, uh, an, a, a processing theory of how one becomes wise. And in that sense, it's not picking up um, as well as it could um, the philosophical heritage given to us by people like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Marcus Aurelius, e etc. We then took a look at um, the theory of Sternberg, um, just extremely pivotal figure in um, the, the psychology, the cognitive science of wisdom. And we took a look at his theory, and I pointed out his ideas about adapting, shaping, and selecting uh, are clearly uh, uh, ideas about relevance realization. He invokes uh, uh, implicit processing, tacit knowledge, in, or in order to bring understanding in, uh, that in sort of intuitive grasping of the significance of information, I think is what he's implying. We talked about the, how he involves a balancing of interests, and there's the interpersonal, how you're connected to yourself, the interpersonal, how you're connected to other pe people, the extrapersonal, how you're connected uh, to the world, and so that's at least important connections to, implicitly at least, I mean, um, important connections to uh, meaning in life that we've been talking about throughout this course. He invokes balance throughout, and I try to make a good case that you should see that as optimization and directly relevant, therefore, to uh, accounts of optimization or processing that we discuss with connection to uh, relevance realization. There were some issues I had with Sternberg. Uh, the idea that all wise people, all of this machinery is directed towards the common good, that strikes me as anachronistic. I think um, a, a less uh, contentious claim would be that it's directed towards virtue and meaning in life for oneself and others in some unspecified way. There was also the invocation of values as affecting or constraining the whole uh, process. Again, it was unclear to me what this is. There's an ambiguity here. It could be the relatively trivial claim that the wise person is being regulated by normativity you know, by considerations of what's true and good and beautiful. Um, and that would be definitional because w w wisdom is a normative term and therefore relatively trivial. Or it could be that specific values are being invoked here. Uh, but if that's the case, they should be specifically stated and then justified for why those ones are chosen and explicitly explained how those specific values make an impact on specific aspects of the machinery. Uh, so that's all sort of uh, missing and needs to be addressed. It's ultimately a product theory, not a process theory. Sternberg does have a theory of foolishness, but it's not independently generated, and it doesn't really pick up on the centrality of seeing through illusion and into reality. So if you'll allow me, 
uh, to make use of all of that machinery, not only the machinery that we've talked about in the psychology of wisdom, but the machinery that many of these theorists are either explicitly or implicitly invoking, all of the philosophical uh, work we already covered um, in the first half of the course uh, connected to wisdom. I, I want to try and humbly draw upon that and talk about a uh, proposal made by myself and Leo Ferraro. If you know, remember, Leo and I have done work together on flow, which I've, I've talked about, or work on mindfulness that I've talked about. Uh, this is work from 2013. So the place to start is to go back to what we saw and what uh, uh, argued for. So I, I hope I don't have to recapitulate that whole argument, right? that we have these two competencies. We have sort of an inferential competence that has to do with our propositional knowing. And we have an insight competence right, over here. And that has to do with construal. And that has to be, that's more sort of procedural perspectival. I'll come back to that point because that's one of my criticisms of Verveke and Ferraro. And then the idea here is that this is enhanced and protected from undue influence from sort of more S1 processing by active open-mindedness. And then I argued, uh, following Jacobs and Teasdale, right, and also arguments derived from the, the need for an independent competence on control, et cetera, right, that while this is really clearly the case for theoretical context and more uh, therapeutic or at least ex existentially developmental context, we want this uh, to be foregrounded and we want it protected from that and so we want it developed by mindfulness. And you understand that by mindfulness I mean a style that coordinates psychotechnologies together of meditation, contemplation, um, perhaps uh, flow interaction with the environment. That brought up the immediate uh, question of, okay, how are these coordinated together? Now, one answer might be that they are just opponent processing and they are self-organizing, and, and, and that's potentially uh, viable. But there's, we already at this point, uh, sorry, that sounds so self-congratulatory. I don't mean it that way. Uh, okay, w we argued, let's just state it that way. We argued that whereas this is giving priority to uh, propositional knowledge, this has to do with uh, pro procedural knowledge, skills of attention, uh, basically with cultivating certain skills of attention. And then the idea was that active open-mindedness and propositional knowing basically, we argued then, uh, give you knowledge of facts. This, this gives you knowledge of events, right, or processes. So, right, this basically tells you about, uh, we're understanding what a fact is as cross-contextual patterns, events or processes are things that are unfolding like idiosyncratically, like in time and space. I'm not, I mean, I, 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 that's sort of right. Uh, perhaps a better way of putting this that would align it with the stuff we talked about with um, Swartz and Sharp is this is your grasping of principles and this is your grasping of processes. And this would therefore largely be sort of like uh, what's being talked about in Sophia, and this is largely what perhaps what was being talked about in Phronesis. We suggested that. Uh, I'm still open to that suggestion. I'm not quite sure that it, it, it maps a as cleanly as that now. But in addition to this clearly uh, uh, propositional and uh, at least centrally procedural, uh, we invoked perspectival. Right, so this is propositional. This is largely procedural. And then this is perspectival. And then, right, so if this has to do with inference, this has to do with insight, and we've already got a good sense. We've seen this. Uh, we didn't, we were not aware, because it hadn't been generated. We were not aware of Grossman's work at the time, but we knew uh, the Berlin uh, work. And this is, of course, what's being managed here is internalization. How do you learn to 
take, adopt and take other people's perspectives and internalize them within your own processing so they become metacognitively effective. And then we, we said, well, what perspectival knowing did, and here's where I want to I'll, 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 I'll launch one of my, I think, first cr criticisms. We said, well, what perspectival knowing does is it integrates knowledge of facts with knowledge of events. It sort of helps you to use, I think, maybe better language. It helps you to put principles into process and have processes governed by principles. And that's what sort of perspectives are doing. So this is, we're talking about the, the epitome of this is a skill and the epitome of this is a theory. And what a perspective does is put theories and skills together. I think that's kind of right, uh, still in a sense, but I, I think the relationship is, and this is a, um, what I would argue for here, the relationship is more like this, that propositional knowledge is grounded in, but affected by procedural knowledge, your skills, knowing how to interact. And then that this, your, your ability to cultivate skills and then apply them to the propositional knowledge is grounded in your perspectival knowing because that's going to give you your situational awareness that you need to cultivate the skills and uh, so that you can apply your knowledge of principles. And then I would argue that that's, and you've seen me make this argument before, this is ultimately grounded in your participatory knowing. The agent arena attunement um, that affords your being in the world and your ability to go through modal transformation, existential change. So that also brings up, I might as well mention it now, another criticism of this, of this theory, which is, although it's talking about propositional and procedural knowledge and perspectival knowing, there, where there's no clear discussion here of participatory knowing. And that's a significant lacuna in the theory for the following reason. Without an account of participatory knowing, um, for all of its claims, the Verveke and Farrar theory of being a process theory uh, rather than a product theory, without talking about the participatory knowing, it really can't incorporate into its account of becoming wise how one goes through transformational experience, how one goes through modal change. I mean modal in the existential sense, not um, the logical sense. So without connecting participatory knowing to this overarching schema, the connections between wisdom, transformative experience, altered states of consciousness, all of these things that we've discussed are actually uh, crucially missing uh, from this theory and therefore its claim to being an adequate processing theory uh, can be uh, uh, rather significantly challenged. I, and I think that, that so that needs um, important development. We did talk about a cognitive style that you could cultivate. Uh, one more thing. I think what we were doing is also we were smuggling in that the, the perspectival knowing with the process of identity creation that's central uh, to participatory knowing. Um, so I, I think that was also uh, part of the problem. Now, uh, what we did argue is that this is set within a cognitive style that will give you a higher order way of regulating active open-mindedness and mindfulness. And here we took directly from the philosophical tradition and we talked about internalizing the sage. Right. Internalizing Socrates, internalizing the Buddha, internalizing Jesus, internalizing the sage. And we talked about wh what impact that has. Uh, so we, you know what this is. Internalize, we talked about this repeatedly, what the process of internalization is, what it's like to internalize Socrates, etc., etc. And we've already seen how central that is to wisdom. Uh, see, so while this is overcoming fallacious reasoning, right, This is overcoming misframing, misconstrual. What this is doing is it's helping you to overcome egocentrism in a powerful way. 
These are all ways in which we can fall into illusion. So, self-deception. But we also talked about what does internalizing the sage do? What's, when you get that metacognitive enhancement, you get that perspectival ability, uh, what's it doing? So here we talked about a virtue that you haven't heard me talk about very much, and it's, it's unfortunate because in some ways this, this, this is, okay, so the, the ancient Greeks had four cardinal virtues. Wisdom, which is really kind of a meta-virtue. Right? Justice, which we talk a lot about. Courage. Um, and then the fourth is this word, sophrosyn. Now, sophrosyn is often translated as temperance. doesn't capture it well. Moderation doesn't capture it well. So I want to, uh, to uh, put uh, aside um, that and, and try and come back at this. But you see, if you went to the Delphic Oracle, there were uh, things in, inscribed on the wall there, and one was know thyself, and that's clearly you know, connected and Socrates made it his own, and we, we've come to know what that means, how the, the, the knowledge of oneself is, of course, not, the, not romantic autobiography, but a, a deep understanding of the principles by which you're operating. But the other one was everything in moderation, which was like this, and it, but that's not, right? That, again, moderation is good, but it's not quite right. It, it's, and, and, and we know this is connected to something like Aristotle's notion of the golden mean, that all virtue, and remember what that is, you're trying to create, you're trying to create a virtual engine that right, right, generates enough options so you don't suffer vices of deficit, but also generates enough, right, there's enough governance, there's enough selective constraints so that it also thwarts uh, vices of excess. So there, there's, there's a kind of optimization going on there. And as I said, there, which you, you get a little bit in the word moderation, but moderation sounds more like averaging and settling. I, I, we argued that there's a better way of trying to understand this by understanding it in something that it was often contrasted with, which is in Kratia. So you know this word. This is demos Kratia right? Power or rule by the people. And, and kratia is sort of uh, exercising power on yourself. So this is kind of like self-restraint, self-control. And so a way of getting at this is to think about um, the, the, the fact that you could be practicing a virtue, a virtue, in cratically or uh, in a sarfacinic manner. Let me give you an example. So here's two people. There's Tom and there's Susan. Tom is honest, or at least he's trying to become honest. Now Tom goes into situations and Tom sees clearly the potential to lie and he sees clearly the benefit that would accrue to him if he lies. And it comes with a tremendous sort of temptation. There's a tremendous impulse. And so he exercises self-control and he doesn't lie. And Tom is to be commended for that. That is a, an important kind of honesty. But consider Susan. Susan comes into a situation. She clearly sees the opportunity to lie. She clearly sees the advantages that would accrue to her if she lies, but that's it. It's like when we talked about Frankfurt and whether or not some, it's unthinkable to her, not in the sense that she can't think the thought, I can lie, or think or imagine to herself lying. It's not a viable option to her. She can't, she can't get into the existential mode where that draws on her in any way. So although she can think it in one sense, in a Frankfurtian sense, it is unthinkable to her. It just, she's not tempted to lie in that sense. Many of us, myself included, would side with the Greeks in saying, Susan is more honest than Tom. Right? Because honesty is now second nature to Susan in a way it isn't to Tom. So that's Sophrason at least one aspect of it. Do you remember, we, you, you see that, remember when we were doing Paul and Agape, 
And Paul says, now I will show you the most excellent way. And, and, and then he's talking, of course, about agape as the most excellent way. And then he says, remember, in order to try and get you to understand the, uh, the transformation, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I acted like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things behind me. And remember we talked about that? When you're a child, you're, you're deeply tempted by toys. Your salience landscape automatically organizes in a certain way. But when you're an adult, when I'm a man, I come in and I see Spencer's toys. I know that they're there. I know that I can play with them. But they have no pull on me. They do not call me. They do not tempt me. Right? And as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. The sage has a salience landscape in which they are not tempted to self-deception in the ways that we so readily are. That's sophrosun. It is to have a salience landscape that has gone through a kind of fundamental reversal. It is not, I mean these are all differences of emphasis, but like the way our salience landscape is less oriented towards the self-deceptiveness of a child, the sage's salience landscape is less oriented towards our pre prevalent and pervasive forms of self-deception. They see through illusion and into reality. So this is, of course, deeply perspectival. And, and I want to add a little bit more to it because it, it's not just, right? I, I, sorry, you see this, like in, in, in Taoism, it comes through, right? Um, the idea that, right, well, like once you've trained enough, you, 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 just, have to, you just have to let, you, the sage can just let things unfold naturally. Right? You, you see this, in, you know, even in Augustine, you know, love God and then do what you want. Of course, you have to love God. That means if you really, truly love God, if agape is flowing through you, like, as Paul recommends, then you have sophrosin and then you will just, you will, and, and this is what I want to say, you will be tempted to the good. You will be tempted, just like you can be tempted, right, your salience landscape naturally self-organizes towards self-deception. Your salience landscape, if you're wise, naturally self-organizes towards seeing through illusion, zeroing in on what's relevant and important and how it is relevant to the project of becoming more virtuous, and having a more meaningful life. You're tempted, you're naturally tempted to the good. That's sophrosin. And so we argued that what's, what you're doing here is you're a cult of, you're, you are internalizing the sage, and what that's doing is helping to overcome egocentrism in this deep sense of helping you to realize sophrosin. And so this means, we argued that there's deep connections, and I don't think these have been explored enough, uh, between wisdom and sophrosin. And of course, sophrosin is a kind of optimization of your perspectival knowing. It's that I've optimized my perspectival knowing, so it's always ser in service, uh, and this is what was to some degree missing from this theory, right? It's in the service of my agent arena relationship and how that is being developed being developed, that reciprocal realization, so that I can go through the important transformations that are needed to become a wise person. We argued that what the sophrosin is directed towards were three M's, obviously morality, more broadly construed as not just knowing the rules, but the capacity for being virtuous, uh, realizing meaning in life. Now, uh, a, a deficit there is we, on, the, we only had um, self-determination theory, Rice and, uh, DC and Ryan, um, on this kind of stuff, and much more work, much more significant work has been done with Meaning in Life, work that I'm doing with Talia Vrancidis, uh, Jensen Kim, Philip Reswick, and we're presenting at APA uh, this year. And so uh, this theory needs to be revised, and I've tried to show you that um, in, in the course uh, to more directly connect this machinery to meaning in life. So this needs significant improvement. We did argue that meaning in life is irreducible a la uh, wolf to morality. And then something we talked about is mastery. We use the three M's because they're helpful. Um, 
we did. I'm not. I'm not comfortable with that term anymore because uh, of all of its political co connotations. Um, we were thinking of it more like in almost in the academic sense, like when you get your MA, uh, and, the, and then when you know in the older sense, like when you did your masterpiece. Uh, what we meant here was you know a, a terrific capacity for caring and coping uh, with reality. You had sets of skills. You had sets of psychotechnologies. You had sets of uh, roles that you could take. So this gives you roles, like propositional, no sorry, propositional knowing gives you rules. Uh, procedural knowing gives you, you know, uh, various routines. This uh, perspective knowing gives you various roles. And being able to use, you know, rules and routines and roles you know, with, uh, with mastery in coping and caring uh, was central. Again, always guided under the gu governance, under the regulation of, of Sofferson. So I've already, I, I mean, so this is a processing account. It tells you how uh, to become wise. You cultivate active open-mindedness. You cultivate mindfulness. You cultivate internalizing the sage. We used sports psychology here as a way of trying to get um, what that looks like. We also used, of course, developmental psychology, Vygotsky. But sports psychology talks about um, very much how people go through a process of internalizing the coach. And that's strongly analogous to an internalizing the sage. And so we talked about you cultivate active open-mindedness, you cultivate mindfulness, you cultivate internalizing the sage, um, and, and you're guided overall by trying to become sophrocynic uh, in that. And so this is a processing theory. As I've mentioned, I think it, it, there's a, a, a deficit in it. It does not take into account, it, it, it's, what's absent from it is transformational experience. Uh, tra transformational development. And these are all very uh, telling things. Uh, uh, the, the role or relationship between this and altered states of consciousness was not properly developed. Uh, the participatory knowing, which of course connects uh, to the transformational experience, is missing. So wisdom is not connected to Gnosis here in any uh, important way. So those are some I important um, criticisms I would have. The relationship between the kinds of knowing wasn't well developed. We sort of just uh, argued that while well, perspective on knowing sort of synthesizes these together, I think that's too simplistic. The, uh, a much more complex relationship, uh, I, you've seen me argue for in this course, I think needs to, is, is being developed and needs to be developed. Two things that were strongly implicit um, in other people. Oh, I should mention uh, a core aspect of this theory that I think is still central is that all of this, all of this, and we made this very explicit, all of this is, and this came out, I, I, it was so part of this conversation that I forgot to take a moment and explicate it, that all of this is about enhancing relevance realization. Our main argument is that wisdom is some kind of comprehensive optimization of cognition. And then I would extend that now, consciousness, character, etc. And that in order to optimize cognition in a comprehensive fashion and in a developmental fashion, that means that what you're doing is enhancing relevance realization. And we, all, we, we already saw that at work throughout this. And we saw that relevance realization is central in uh, the theories that, the explicit psychological theories that we've already examined. Now in connection with that, there's another serious uh, lacuna in this theory, uh, which is that although it does something I think that's very important, it connects wisdom to, to insight, let's start here. I mean, it's, it's, it would be odd to say, you know, Sam is very wise, but he's not very insightful. That seems wrong. We could, we could say things like, you know, Sam is very wise and he's maybe not very educated. Um, he might not be sort of super intelligent. That's fine, he, right? But to say that Sam is wise and not insightful, well, that seems to trespass on that McGee and Barber point about seeing through illusion. Right? Wisdom definitely has to do with, you know, gaining knowledge in the best way, theoretical knowledge, um, obviously gaining procedural knowledge. Uh, so the wise person knows how to believe well, uh, and that seems also deeply, deeply right. 
the, the wise person is overcoming egocentrism, internalizing the sage. The, the, the traditions point to this very clearly, and they point towards uh, um, Sofrason, the most excellent way. Uh, and, and of course, uh, one way in which this, we, we could understand this, is exactly the Pauline recommendation, right? That the best form of Sofrason is agape. So, but what's missing? So I've already pointed um, many things, but something that's central here is a theory of understanding. To say that, you know, we, like, oh, Bill is very wise. He's so insightful. He's, you know, he's so capable of self-transcendence and overcoming egocentrism. He believes things really well. Like, he's not easily duped. But he doesn't understand. He doesn't have deep or profound understanding of things. It's like, no, no, that's not right. Why is pe one of the ways people zero in on relevant information is by being more insightful, yes. One of the ways they zero in on uh, relevant information is by, like avoiding uh, bias and fallacy in their inferential changes of their beliefs, right? One way in which they over, right, one way in which they zero in on relevant information, overcome egocentrism is all of the, the, the perspectival internalization, the cultivation of Sofferson. But what's missing, and we saw this uh, in our, our DELT work uh, very clearly, uh, we saw it implied in Sternberg's, and so, right, uh, we should have taken this into account. Wisdom should also have within it a clear theory or connected to a clear theory of understanding. Um, and so I think that's also missing. What is it to enhance understanding? What is it to develop a profound understanding? So I want to try and at least discuss that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the place where I have a complete theory of understanding. I've been doing a lot of work on it, work that I'm actually doing with Leo Ferraro. And, I, and because that theory is still very much a work in progress, I'm also not clear quite how right, it would fit into this. What would be the cognitive style for tapping into the participatory knowing? And how does that relate to enhanced understanding? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't know. Um, so uh, the criticisms have shown me many ways in which um, there's important lacuna. There's things that are underdeveloped. Um, and things of which I'm, I'm ignorant. However, I, and I'm going to try and address the understanding issue in a moment, I would like to say, nevertheless, we, we can see how all of the theories, right, converge, including this one, on relevance realization, intelligence, rationality, these different kinds of knowing, and integrating them together, optimization, they're all zeroing in on this so that we see, remember back to this old diagram, everything converging onto RR and then coming out into all these aspects of human spirituality. And here's one I've made, I think, a plausible case for that it really helps, plays a crucial role in helping us to give a naturalistic account of what wisdom is. That I think I've made a plausible case for. Now, what about understanding? Well, we already saw it invoked with this grasping of significance. And it's interesting in a completely independent and convergent manner. When you look through a lot of the current philosophy of understanding, this is where people are now distinguishing understanding from knowledge, distinguishing understanding from just possessing an explanation, because an explanation is a set of propositions, right? So there is the idea that understanding is something beyond possessing an explanation. It's something above and beyond simply knowing. We already saw with Keeks this idea of grasping the significance. And I pointed out to you that that could be understood in terms of construal and uh, relevance realization. What I am saying is if you take a look at the philosophy of understanding literature, this idea that understanding goes beyond knowledge and explanation in the grasping of the significance of the knowledge is something to which you can make, you can draw a, a, a quite powerful convergence argument. Many people are converging on this idea. 
there's, there's some variation on what they think, right? What they think this uh, grasping the significance is. I think to go back to Smedzlin, right, uh, that it has to do, like we saw, with grasping the relevance of what you know. That he, remember, that was one of the key features of his account of understanding. So in addition to all the implication relations and logical relations, there were relations of relevance, non-propositional. And then I argued that that construal plays a central role. And that construal can be understood in terms of problem formulation, the relevance realization machinery that's found within problem formulation. So I would argue that what we're talking about is a, a, is a really good construal. And we have a way of talking about that already, right? We have the notion of an optimal grip. I have a really good construal that has a structural functional organization. I've sized up the situation well, you know, feature to gestalt, the r right degree of transparency opacity. I'm getting an optimization on my grip on things. So this is good contact, uh, right? That's the good construal. And then what it does is it affords me to, right, to grasp um, the, 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 what's relevant in this situation. How I've sized up the situation and got an optimal grip on it affords, remember in Mateson, good problem formulation, right? Now, we also saw something else. If you remember we, we, the connection to good problem finding, and that's why I talked about the, the problem nexus, and I promised to come back. I talked about Arlen, but I also uh, mentioned at that point Uh, the work of, the very recent work, all my markers are running out, of de Reguet. And I, I'm, I'm, I've never met this person, so I hope I get their name right. I just want to copy this very carefully. Uh, Chicksburg, I'm not sure uh, if that's right or not. This is work from 2017. And then there's also Direct, uh, his own book on uh, understanding, and there's a, a, a lot of uh, a, a good work going on about this. It's very exciting stuff. They point towards what they call um, the standard of effectiveness for understanding. I understand something. What, 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 what's the contrast here? Okay. You don't want to say that somebody has understood something, uh, and, and what that means is they've, they've grasped the truth. Now, they, they have to be trying to grasp the truth. That's important. But, and, and, and that'll come out in a moment, right? But you can't say, well, if they didn't grasp the truth, they don't understand, because then you're, you're faced to say the following thing, that, you know, most people have never understood anything, because most people's beliefs in the past are false, and most of my beliefs right now are false, so I'm, I'm actually not uh, understanding. You don't want to tie understanding too tightly to truth in that fashion. So instead of try, tying it to truth, you might want to try it more to something like rationality, where you are trying, right, you're using the best methods for trying to get at the truth. Uh, that's more plausible. A and this would also help to explain why in the prototypical instances within science, we use things that aren't true in order to generate understanding. You, go, you open a science textbook, and they'll show the atom with this little circle and things going around it. Right? And that, that's, all, that's pretty much completely false. It doesn't matter that it's false. It is effective for helping you to grasp the significance of the scientific model of the atom, to draw, as Cherniak would say, the right implications, look for the right connections. It helps you zero in on the relevant information in the right way, and that's why it's used. N nobody, n right, you're making a mistake if you think most of the diagrams and the idealizations that are at work in science are attempts to represent the truth accurately. They are not. They are attempts to effectively get you to zero in on the relevant implications, make the relevant connections, as Smedzland would say. This is what is meant by effectiveness, right? Effectiveness is exactly doing, and then they talk about how what, what, 
it is to say that somebody understands something is that they're good at you know being able to apply their knowledge right find new domains open up new areas of research so of course it's this multi-apt ability to apply what their their good problem formulation here to transfer it and transform it and specify it in many different ways and what's impl implied in here of course is a, an important capacity for problem finding somebody who has good understanding can facilitate a need for they can motivate and facilitate a need for cognition because they can use that to go out and find and formulate problems perhaps zero in on important a pr important problem nexus So, and of course, this optimal grip is giving me something that Degret, Degret, or Degret, I don't know how he pronounces his name, um, also talks about, uh, many people talk about the idea that understanding is contextually sensitive, it's contextually relative. To know that I understand something is relative to the situation at hand and relative to the person at hand. You and I can both know the same things. Right? But if you're in situation and situation, you're in situation A and situation B, you might understand those things because you can apply them in A. I don't I couldn't be said to understand them as well because I can't apply them in situation B. Right? Also, right, we could be in the same situation, but I have a different set of skills. And so I can apply my knowledge better than you can. I understand better than you can. Right? So there's very much that this is context relative. And I would then add, of course, context sensitive, and you, right? And that, of course, is the context sensitivity, whereas this is the ability to do things in a much more context general way. And of course, I'm invoking the machinery of relevance realization, I'm invoking it in, in a good construal, and then the ability to transfer it, right, insightfully. I would also argue that one more thing is needed, right? And you know where, where this, because we've already got the idea that when, if I am making these kinds of forward commitments, cognitive commitments, they need to be backed by a law of convergence. So that my construct is also trustworthy. I've done a lot, and of course, to overcome self-deception. So if basic understanding is to grasp the significance, grasp, right, through relevance realization, the relevant implication, the relevant connections, right, this is what I'm trying to suggest to you, that basic understanding becomes profound understanding when basic understanding is used to generate plausibility. I don't think that's enough because if you'll allow me a, a, a sort of schematic way of putting it, this is very horizontal. It tells you how to bring different domains, right, together into your good control and then apply them to many domains and you're doing the compression, right, and then you're doing the variation, you're doing the relevance, realizing the compression, variation, right, good problem formulation, optimal gripping, Right? This is contextually sensitive. This is effectively right, applied across, in a cross-contextual manner, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But I think understanding also has, if you'll allow me, a vertical domain. Because I think part also of what profound understanding does is it aligns and optimizes the relationship. So if this is plausibility generation, What's being aligned and optimized here, I think, are right, the propositional knowing, right, the procedural, perspectival, and the participatory. I mean, this goes back, right? Somebody who really knew physics wouldn't just be grasping the propositions of physics, they would be able to, they'd have the skills, they'd know how to do physics, 
and they'd have the situational awareness. They would know, you know, which skills to apply and which skills to develop in order to do physics well. There might even be a participatory aspect to it. They might have come to identify with the physicalist worldview and taken up their agency uh, with respect to that, although that might be problematic given arguments from the meaning crisis. But the, the more there's, right, so the more deeply these are aligned and interconnected and mutually facilitating each other, the more capable they are, I would say, of understanding the material. So I think what needs to be developed is a way of theoretically integrating the horizontal that understanding is to generate, well, at least profound understanding, is to take basic understanding, grasping the relevance connections, and make those relevance connections convergence and elegance, optimal gripping, so that profound understanding is to generate plausibility. That's the horizontal. But profound understanding is also to align. So you're getting grounding downward, and you're getting emergence upward, right? the relationship between propositional knowing, procedural knowing, perspectival knowing, and participatory knowing. And then all of that needs to be, of course, integrated into uh, uh, an account of wisdom. As I said, what also needs to be aligned is transformational experience. And that means an account of gnosis needs to also be integrated into the account of wisdom. So, that notion of transformative, of transformation, of knowing through transform transformation and becoming, so that, that knowing and becoming, knowing oneself and knowing the world and becoming a different agent in a different arena, bound together, right? We've talked about this. That transformative knowing, that transformative experience, there's, of course, many instances in which it's rather sudden, or somewhat sudden, and uh, and so it it's has very much important features of insight. And we've taken a look at that. And that, of course, is, again, to recommend it one more time, the seminal and powerful work of L.A. Paul. Now, Agnes Callard, in her book, Aspiration, has, I believe it's 2016, um, has recently argued that there are also instances where people go through this transformative knowing that are much more incremental in nature. She doesn't deny this, but she argues that there are very many instances uh, uh, about this. So all of the, the, all of the stuff we talked about here hasn't been dispensed with. This is being added as a complement and a supplement. So what's an example of this more incremental process? She, get, she gives many examples. Um, so let's use one. You join a music appreciation class. Okay, and so we're using the word appreciation here not in the sense of gratitude, but how it's used when we people talk about music appreciation, art appreciation. So you join a music appreciation class. What would make you a good student in the music appreciation class? If you're there because you want to impress your girlfriend or your boyfriend, or you're there because every time you go, um, you pass the chocolate store and you buy some chocolate, Right, and that sort of, or you're there because you're just trying to get a credit. The person teaching the music appreciation is not going to regard you as a good student. Because why? Because the goal of music appreciation is to come to value music for its own sake. It's, it's to come to, it is to, to come to finding music intrinsically valuable and therefore something that is directly relevant to your meaning in life, something that you directly care about. Now, the, the thing is, if you were a good, now think of the paradox here, and, and this is so beautiful the way uh, Keller brings it out. If I was a good student, I would appreciate music for its own sake. But if I appreciated music for its own sake, I do not need to take the music appreciation class. 
Right? Do you see the paradox here? And, and, and Keller points it, this is the same thing when you decide you're going to undertake a liberal education. The liberal education is going to give you values and preferences that you don't currently have. Right? So the idea is the music appreciation. So what do you do there? How do you, how do you break through that dilemma? Now, let's be very clear. Keller is in agreement with L.A. Paul that you can't get through this in an inferential fashion for all of the arguments we've already seen, right? She talks about it. She does make something uh, clear that I don't think is as clear in Paul's work. She talks about the fact that this process, this process of trying to acquire, right, an appreciation for something as intrinsically valuable, she calls this process aspiration, where you might call this process more inspiration, the sudden insight, right? Inspiration versus aspiration. So you're aspiring. And she points out something that I think is really clear, that this has to be, a form, this has to be something that can be seen as a rational process. Now, of course, there's ways in which we can screw this up. But what she wants to argue is that there's a form of rationality appropriate to aspiration. She calls it proleptic rationality, Prole like when you gave, when you were doing proleptic things in the ancient world, you were trying to encourage people, right, to cultivate particular virtues or values. Uh, proleptic rationality. Why? Because if we were to say that the person who is engaged in aspiration, who is trying to become somebody other than they are, to go through the transformative experience, to have a perspectival knowing, a participatory knowing that they do not currently have. If we were to say, right, and be, because they're not operation, they cannot do that inferentially, they cannot use decision uh, theory to do that. If we were to say, oh, therefore, they're irrational, notice the paradox we fall into. Because we would, have to, we would have to conclude this, that if I am aspiring to rationality, because you have to, that would be an irrational thing to do. If I'm aspiring to virtue, that would be an irrational thing to do. If I decide to take up a liberal education to become a better person, a different better person, then that would be an irrational thing to do. On pain of kind of a, not a propositional contradiction, but a performative contradiction, remember we talked about performative contradiction, this, to call that irrational, would be a performative contradiction. My aspiring to rationality has to be itself a kind of rationality. That's proleptic rationality. Or to use something older, my loving of wisdom my loving of wisdom, my aspiring to becoming wise, cannot itself be an irrational process. It has to be rational. Not inferential rational, for sure. So, first of all, she does that excellent work of saying, look, this is, we've got to broaden our notion of rationality to include aspiration. I would argue we have to broaden our notion of rationality to include inspiration as well. And that's a way in which I'm being uh, radically sort of uh, reconstructive of romanticism. So now the issue becomes what's going on here? Well, I'm going through a process of identity change, transformative experience, participatory knowing, right? And here's where, here's where Keller's work is a, a little bit lacking. Because, well, she makes a very good case for aspiration and a very, very good case that for the nature of aspiration, that it's proleptically rational. She doesn't give us very much towards a psychology of aspiration. And that's, of course, perhaps because she's a philosopher. She does offer uh, a couple of cues. Let's go back to the music appreciation. So I want to be, I want to, and think about how this connects to Sophros and trying to tempt yourself into the good. But you You've got to do it in this tricky way. And think about also how it's related to Gnosis and trying to get out of existential entrapment. So what I've got to do is I've got to give myself, I've got to have a value that will get me currently engaged. Here's, here's my frame now. It will get me currently engaged with music, right? 
but I will be able to give up that value, right, when I actually value music for its own sake. So you see what's going on here. You need to, she calls it a placeholder, but it's actually, in our sense, it's a symbol. It's something that connects the future you and its way of life, or your way of life, to the, to the current you. And it does it by having this double-faced, not duplicitous, because you're aware of this. That's what makes it a rational process. This, right, this double-faced thing. So, right, I may, right, go to the music class because I currently have the value of sort of making myself do things that I find difficult, right? Now, that's not the same value as appreciating music. But I do that, right, it, on, with the understanding that, right, that is temporary. That is to try and get me into a liminal place where I can start to play with what it's like to value music for its own sake, to enter that world. You can see, right, the connections to Gnosis here. You can see the connections to symbolic enactment here. Aspiration is deeply bound up, I would argue, with Gnosis. And then something that Callard doesn't talk at all about, but we've already talked about I think aspiration is deeply connected to wonder. Wonder gets you to question, almost like Socratic aporia, your world view, your sense of self. It opens up and it motivates you, right? It opens you up and motivates you to go through aspirational change. And I think if you have a wonderful kind of Gnosis that's got the appropriate placeholder in place, that's the beginnings of a psychological account of how we can go through aspiration. So I think we can bring what was needed for a theory of wisdom, because of course, philosophia, we aspire to wisdom. And, and we always aspire to wisdom because to claim, and this is a deep point that we've achieved wisdom, is kind of a mistake. So we need an account of understanding, an account right, of Gnosis, and, and, and these are all related, and an account of aspiration. We need them to be further explicated, integrated, and then integrated with uh, the, the account of wisdom that I've been arguing for already. Okay. I want to try and draw this all together now. <coughs> so, I'll, I'm, I, I, I'll point to what's going on, because I'm going to need more time. Um, I'm going to need time from the next episode to try and draw this all together. What I want to do in the drawing together is I want to try and draw this all together into an account of what wisdom is. I'll, I'll say what this is now, so I don't just leave you completely hanging, but I want to come back and develop it. And then I want to try and connect this notion of wisdom back to enlightenment and back to uh, responding, awakening from the meaning crisis. Here's the account of wisdom I'm going to leave you with and then I'm going to come back and try and uh, at least defend, uh, develop and defend a bit. Wisdom is an ecology of psychotechnologies, an ecology of styles that dynamically, and that means reciprocally, right, in a reciprocal fashion, constrain and optimize each other such that there is an overall optimization enhancement of relevance realization. Relevance realization within inference, within insight and intu intuition, in, in, right, the connection to implicit processing, internalization, understanding, gnosis, transformation, and aspiration. Wisdom is an ecology of psychotechnologies and cognitive styles that dynamically enhance relevance realization in inference, insight and intuition, internalization, understanding and gnosis, transformation and aspiration. In that sense, what's happening, right, is something that's already overlapping with the machinery of enlightenment. We're seeing that wisdom is a dynamical system a dynamical system that is counteractive to the machinery of self-deception and that helps to afford 
the self-organized transformation into the life of flourishing, a life that is deeply meaningful. Thank you very much for your time and attention.